This is a snapshot of what life looked like in Iran in the 1970s. Compare it to pictures of California from this era, and they look noticeably similar. And this is Iran today. Despite its seeming wealth, prosperity, and progressiveness, not all was well in the decades before 1979. There were geopolitical forces at work, some at play for decades, and some even going back centuries. So what happened in the time period between this and this? This is Tehran, capital of Iran. In 1972, it was more than just a seat of government. It was a growing international city with over 3 million residents. Men and women both studied as equals at Tehran University. Along Pahlavi Avenue, students and trendy young families frequented coffee shops adorned wearing fashionable American styles popularized in Hollywood films of the era. Just about to lose and many of them driving imported American cars. And though the vast majority of Tehran was and is Muslim, there was a lot of diversity. Throughout history, it's been a religious melting pot. While Iran, whether in the modern times or under a variety of prior empires, has been seen as a Shia Muslim nation. Tehran had a sizable population of Jewish people, Christians, Zoroastrians, and people of the Baha'i faith. Sitting over 1,800 meters above sea level at its highest point and surrounded by hostile mountains, Tehran initially doesn't seem like a place a lot of people want to settle in. Though several hours inland from the vitally important Caspian Sea, it's still part of the historical Silk Road, leading to a vast exchange of goods, ideas, and peoples stretching from China to Europe. I'm centering on Tehran because culturally, politically, and historically, it is the core of the country. And from the era directly after World War II, it appeared to be a city similar in many ways to the likes of San Francisco or New York. The American influence was everywhere. But if Iran was so close to the US, if things were so progressive and so prosperous, why in 1979 was the Shah, the national monarch, overthrown in a massive revolution with religious theocracy put in place afterwards? Very soon we will announce the new government. This land, known as Persia until 1932, was ruled by several empires throughout history. A lot of this has to do with religion. Perhaps most influential were the Safavids, who ruled from the 16th century to the 18th century. Most of Iran at this time was the Sunni Islamic sect, but the 16th century Safavid ruler of the region, Shah Ismail I, declared the empire a Shia state. From there, his empire forcibly converted most under them to Shia Islam leading Iran to this day to be the world's only Shia state. Following the Safavid Empire came the Kaja Empire, and then several wars with the Russians. In the 20th century, things started to take a somewhat progressive turn. There was a huge internal revolution in 1905, which resulted in Iran drafting its first proper constitution. This is it here. The Persian constitution of 1906 is a really incredible document. While on paper, it's still often used as a point of reference in modern Iran, it was most impactful during its own time. Its founders wanted to base it both on teachings from the Quran and model it after the constitution of Belgium, of all places. It established basic rights and a parliament with an appointed prime minister, and even protections of the region's three main religious minorities, Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians. However, after the Russian Revolution, a decade and a bit later, a growing Iranian communist movement was beginning to stir. In 1920, a nation called the Persian Soviet Socialist Republic was declared in the northwest of Iran. A group of them, backed by the Soviet Union, prepared to march on Tehran. This would affect Iran for the next 60 years. The Iranian communists particularly concerned the British, who had major stakes in the Iranian oil industry. The British decided to do what the British do best and interfered. This led to a British-backed coup where this guy Reza Shah was put into power as prime minister and then as a monarch. Not so fun fact, this was motivated by oil. 
the Anglo-Persian oil company was both massively profitable and British owned. Though a colony wasn't established or anything, it could be argued that it was an act of indirect colonialism by the British. Anyway, you know who loves a good chat about colonialism, direct or otherwise? Canubis. He is a great fellow creator. I've brought him here today because I think he can go into this next bit better than I can. When you look at a map of the countries that never got colonized, Iran is a weirdly glaring exception. So what's going on here? Did Iran manage to pull a Thailand and never got colonized by European powers? Well, not exactly. While it might not have fully ended up like nearby Egypt or India, it still found itself sandwiched between the British and Russian empires. If you want to find out more about this history, be sure to watch the companion video to this one over on my channel, Canubis. So what happened in Iran during World War II? What drastic shift happened to make Iran go from this to this? After the Nazis invaded the USSR, the British pushed Iran to expel all Germans currently there. Reza Shahar, the British's own guy, refused, so the Brits and the Soviets invaded and overthrew him. Following the war in 1951, Mohammad Mossadegh was appointed prime minister. Most notably, he started pushing for nationalization of oil reserves in production. This was and is debatably Iran's most valuable resource. At this time, the Anglo-Iranian oil company was again massively profitable. The British may have had stakes in the company directly, but the US was deeply concerned with them as well. It was the 1950s, America was becoming more and more car dependent, and with that, more oil dependent. You know who else is dependent? We are on your subscriptions to help us continue to make these videos. We noticed that only 20% of you are actually subscribed, but if you hit the subscribe button right now, you can check out a video that dives into how America grew in the 1950s and keep up to date with all our future videos. So, all right, back to it. The thought was that an Iran sympathetic to American interests is an Iran that is more willing to sell vast amount of oil to Western countries. Though the American CIA had helped orchestrate several coups around the world since World War II, the first would be the 1953 coup in Iran. This removed the publicly popular Mohammad Mossadegh from power. The American coup had two main effects. First off, it led to increasingly close relations between the US and Iran. This meant that a ton of American media and technology flooded the country. And even remote areas started getting electricity, cars, and TVs, not to mention political closeness between the two governments. And in return, the US and its allies got access to Iranian oil, thanks in part to the Consortium Agreement of 1954, which, get this, gave Western powers a 50% stake. Culturally, Iran seemed to be getting more progressive. Stars became more American, more people were generally accepted, even gay men saw some recognition with a same-sex marriage even being conducted in 1978. At the risk of sounding controversial, some bits even looked comparable to secular life in Israel during this time. This is Iran's supposedly progressive era. But for all the social and technological progress seeming to be made, there were issues in Iran beneath the surface. Democracy had effectively been eroded away completely, and the Shahar was becoming more and more absolute in power. He started using a secret police force called the Savak to take down perceived enemies. Criticism was suppressed and dissidents were tortured. After the standard of living began to falter, especially after the 1973 oil crisis caused rampant inflation, further government corruption during this era caused more widespread issues. By the late 1970s, the quality of life was eroding for many Iranians, with prices of food, energy, and housing exploding. Not to mention there was a huge shortage of people able to work in essential skilled professions, either due to barriers to training or leaving abroad for better opportunities. By 1979, the 34 million people living in Iran were served by fewer than 15,000 doctors. Discontent was also brewing, especially among young people. There was two mindsets here, moving forward progressively into a more accepting, globally connected future, or return to what some see as isolationist religious roots, free from the interference of countries such as the US. And this was all bubbling beneath the surface, so well hidden that in 1979, President Jimmy Carter told the Shahar, Iran is an island of stability in one of the most troubling areas of the world. 
One major force pushing for the latter was a Muslim clerk named Rahullah Hulmaini. While many may consider him a radical, his criticism of the Shahar's government earned him a huge following, especially as the quality of life for average Iranians began to decline. Even early on, the Shahar saw him as dangerous. He was exiled from Iran in 1964 by the government. Though Khomeini had some deeply conservative ideas that he claimed were grounded in religion, especially in regards to believing women to be subservient to men, he and his followers proposed an alternative to life under the Shahar. For better or worse, it was a change. In 1978, Iran hit a tipping point. A newspaper in Tehran published an article deeply criticizing Khomeini. In response, protests broke out in Tehran, led by religious students. This was the start of the revolution. Strikes and demonstrations spread throughout the country like wildfire, and the Shahar quickly lost his grip. As the revolution went on, focus shifted away from media criticism to general vast unhappiness with life under the Shahar. The following January, the government of Iran effectively fell. The Shahar fled to the United States and Khomeini returned from exile, greeted by mass celebration at home. A new government was established and the country was declared a Muslim theocratic republic, literally now called the Islamic Republic of Iran. Protection for minority groups would be removed with many people outright losing their rights. Women, for example, would now have to wear a head covering whenever in public and had no legal protections against domestic violence. Many in Iran saw the revolution as a time for change. A new government was proposed, one perhaps ruled by a 300 member constituent assembly, whose first task would be ratifying the new constitution. But that's not how things played out. Instead of a constituent assembly, the constitution was ratified by a 75 member assembly of experts. In the final version of the government in place today, Khomeini himself and his successors would hold the ultimate highest role of government, the supreme leader. Iran today is a very different country than it was pre-revolution. Often at odds with the West, they've gained infamy for their nuclear program and numerous human rights abuses. The US and other Western nations tend to stay away due in part to memories of their last interference and in part due to Iran's almost impenetrable mountainous defense, which has stayed off outsiders for centuries. But sometimes a general is killed or an oil deal is made, either in an attempt to assert global dominance or to fuel the machine of the modern world. In regards to women's rights and the rights of LGBTQ plus people, Iran ranks amongst the lowest in the world. But even in Iran, change seems possible and the fault lines have not gone away. In 2017, protests against the government broke out around the country. Whilst this led to a brutal retaliation and a temporary internet blackout, maybe it's a sign. Not all was perfect in Iran's progressive age at all, but it was certainly a huge contrast to today. And even in the most repressive of places, things never stay the same forever.